Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Fishing for the Future. I'm Stuart Sandin, a professor of marine ecology and director of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Thank you for tuning in. I'd like to give a special welcome to our guests who are joining us from the VIP experience, who are right now enjoying a meal from the fishery in, in San Diego, along with some cocktails from our friends at Cutwater Spirits. We're honored to have you, you all here tonight from our close community, our event partners, our panelists, and all our friends from afar. We're here to celebrate the ocean community and to talk with some leaders and shining lights working to improve our relationship with the ocean. Tonight, we've partnered with Salty Cinema, a group of talented science communicators and filmmakers, all Scripps alumni, who showcase ocean-inspired films made by a community of scientists, surfers, fishers, and divers. We're gonna view a short film produced by Salty Cinema followed by an interactive discussion with our panelists. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the event via the chat features in Facebook. Without further ado, I give you Salty Cinema Live. To stare at a plate of seafood is to contemplate far more than your own appetite. If we trace its journey back from the table, the seafood may start in the ocean, but that is only the beginning. The seafood may have been caught illegally, with forced slave labor, sold on a black market, then shipped to the far side of the planet, only to be served as a mislabeled dish. Or the seafood may have been caught nearby and served to you by the fisher herself. Understanding the spectrum of seafood stories is beyond the grasp of any one discipline or any one perspective. Each product travels with its own story, some bone chilling and others heartwarming. With so many options, a question like, what seafood should I eat, can receive no shallow answer. Scripps Oceanography has dedicated more than a century to exploration and discovery, rising to the challenge to provide world-class science as a pillar for societal action. We believe that innovative research and open dialogue are prerequisite for each of us to make informed decisions to define our tomorrow. The consideration of what to put on our plate represents a gateway of opportunity. Food brings us together to create meaningful conversations. Let's spend some time now thinking about our plate and exploring our relationship with the ocean. By sharing experiences here from across the ocean community, we consider the basic question, what is sustainable seafood? Tonight we'll be hearing from Ian Urbina an award-winning investigative journalist whose New York Times best-selling book uncovered social injustices on fishing boats working the high seas. Vita Wade, an ocean advocate from the Caribbean island of Montserrat, who has run her own sustainable seafood restaurant and recently founded the Aqua Caribbean Blue Economy Conference. Dr. Sarah McDonald, a senior fishery scientist for the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program. David Price, who oversees social and environmental responsibility at PriceSmart, Inc., the largest operator of retail warehouse clubs in Central America, the Caribbean, and Colombia. And Bren Smith, a lifelong commercial fisherman and world leader in regenerative ocean farming. I measure fresh seafood in hours and minutes. Right? Not days. That way, you know, I grew up in Newfoundland, and so like, it, like a fresh is that day. The debate and discussion around sustainable seafood, I feel like a consumer of what to eat. It's just confusing. You go in a store, there are red, greens, blues, there's apps at restaurants, and it's always changing. And I'll just go order chicken, right? Because I don't know what to, um, what to do. And I think that's a real challenge we have as, a, as an industry. And there's been incredible work trying to make that simpler and doing consumer education. You know, wild fish, I think, should move to the beef category where it's a cherished, delicious moment you have, um, uh, where you celebrate the last hunted food on the planet. You cherish the fact that fishermen are, are still out there making a living on their boats and these communities are supported. But as our land-based food system gets pushed out to sea, right, because of drought and, and other issues, and our wild fisheries can't handle the burden of those new pressures, we need to completely reorganize the plate and um, think what's gonna be in the center and that I just don't believe that's gonna be fish. 
local and eating local, the elders have always sort of put this down to the reason for long life, the reason for healthy skin and and things like this. So there is this sort of intrinsic um, being able to eat pure is is the answer to having a better life and a better health, which is in many ways true. We catch everything we eat in terms of fish, but just, I guess, by the very nature of who we are, who I am, the work I do, and the um, sort of exposure, education, and awareness that I've had, we wouldn't eat certain species of fish. We're just really mindful of, of what we eat in that way. Um, its impact on the environment, whether or not it's going to cause harm to the coral reef, whether or not it's more valuable to be in the sea so that we can enjoy it. And we also look to see whether or not it is uh, in any way threatened or endangered. There's certainly different ways to define local. I think technically they say less than 400 miles in terms of food miles and nodes uh, along the, the value chain. But there's other ways to think about local. Uh, and I, one of the examples I think of that's not a, a seafood example is coffee. Most of the U.S. is not the right climate for growing coffee, but we all, most of us drink it. So there's other ways to buy coffee that feels local. Maybe it's not in fact truly geographically local, but it has some of the elements from a ethos perspective of uh, local. And I think seafoods probably can be thought of in a similar sense. However, it's more complicated than coffee. Right, because we're talking about um, animals that all have different life cycles in terms of you know how much time does it take to replenish the resource after we've drawn from it, right? Uh, but I think it's a complex issue because not everybody lives on the ocean, and uh, it's not always possible to eat locally. You know, if you're buying it from the fisherman himself or herself, then it's probably not processed at that point. They're doing their own flaying and their own processing right there. So that's as local as it gets. Every species isn't necessarily what Seafood Watch would rate as sustainable. So for example, Pacific Bluefin Tuna is an overfished species, meaning that it's depleted, that there aren't that many. And overfishing is occurring, meaning that they're catching too many to maintain a healthy, sustainable stock. And Bluefin Tuna are landed in San Diego. So I would say that not all local seafood is sustainable. But if you're buying from a local fisherman or a local dock, you're probably ensured that it's probably not going overseas to be processed and then shipped back. I do think the buy local concept has real merit, right? So the, the food sources that are being transported so much further away, and especially food sources that used to be luxury that have, have now become commonplace and are being transported from far away. Those are the ones that worry me most from a climate change and carbon emissions point of view, from a how could it possibly only cost that much point of view. You know, like where are the hidden savings? Who's not getting paid? What illegalities or, you know, environmental abuses are happening so as to get that, you know, can of skipjack tuna all the way here in two weeks flat for $1.99? That doesn't seem possible. Yeah, this is a tough question because um, there's always the typical answers of overfishing and bycatch and ecological impacts from fishing. And I think those are all really significant. But, you know, under the broad um, umbrella of climate change, I think we're, there's an existential threat to all ecological based industry. Sea level rise, change in temperature, ocean acidification. I mean, all these things are going to impact the, the most important source of protein for humankind. So, you know, it, this is something we really have to be honest with ourselves about and address. We're really concerned about it at PriceMart, and I think it's really influencing how we're thinking about sustainability throughout, um, not just seafood, but everything we do, our facilities, our packaging, our supply chain, right? So freight and reducing our emissions. So that's, for me, I think is probably number one. The, the number one challenge I see is, is climate change at every level. Like, we have to produce more food with less resources. Even in my, my setting where I'm trying to grow uh, climate resilient crops and turn myself into a climate farmer, what am I going to be growing 10 years from now as my waters change? What's actually been happening has been happening at a very sort of like top-down approach, a very colonial sort of approach where um, 
the control of the resources and the benefit of the resource is not staying in the region, is not upskilling the people, is not developing the communities, is not really creating a social impact. And so um, there's definitely room for us to do this differently. It's just really going to take a lot of um, you know, eye to eye partnership, a lot of equal partnership, some uncomfortable conversations, and a lot of those collaborations need to happen on the ground, in the grassroots, with local fishers. In a soundbite, I would say that it's the global north's demand for cheap seafood. But let me explain, because it's also the economic disparities between the global north and the developing south. You know, we want cheap seafood. Um, and there are a lot of industrialized nations that have very large distant water fishing fleets. What that means is that they send their boats out very far and those distant water fleets, for example, China, Taiwan, South Korea, will fish in another country's exclusive economic zone. And sometimes this is legal, sometimes this is illegal because these fleets fish far away from home, there's often a lack of oversight and it can um, facilitate what's called illegal, unreported and unregulated or IUU fishing. But what they're doing is depleting the natural resources of those countries that rely on their local fish stocks for protein. The fishing industry, especially the distant water fishing industry, has long been given kind of a pass when it comes to accountability and tracking. You know, um, you can't fly a plane most places in the world from X location to Y location and not expect to have to declare who you're carrying, what you're carrying, what route you're gonna fly, keeping your transponder on at all times. But you can on the water. And um, that um, cultural and legal and just sort of economic acquiescence has allowed for it to be so difficult to know, especially from, from the port to the hook, you know, or the net, um, what's going on out there. Big buyers that don't even expect to know what ships that product crossed and what crews were handling them. Um, that, that's in a lot of industry would not be allowed and it shouldn't be allowed in fishing. You've got fixed costs with fishing. So fuel is a fixed cost, um, bait is a fixed cost. 30 to 50% of the cost of fishing is labor. And so if you've got this very low profit margin and you've got this high demand for cheap seafood, where are you gonna cut your costs? You're gonna cut your costs on labor. And so that also then facilitates forced labor and human trafficking and child labor in these, in these fleets. It's estimated that between 25 and 30% of the world's fish is caught through IUU fishing. So that's a big problem. San Diego, you know, look at postcards of San Diego. What do you see? You see beach and palms and, you know, we have this real affinity to the ocean, but those connections don't always carry through to our sources of seafood. 10% or less of seafood restaurants and or seafood markets consistently carry seafood that's landed right here in San Diego. Here is a map showing the distributions of seafood markets throughout the city. What this is telling me is there are seafood markets throughout the entire city, so there should be seafood demand throughout the entire city. In this map, what we see are all the same markets, except now they're color-coded according to how often they carry um, seafood that was landed in San Diego, so by San Diego commercial fishermen. What really jumps out is any of the markets that sell local seafood occasionally or consistently, at least 80% of them were within two kilometers of the coast. So there's definitely this geographic barrier of local seafood and it's not permeating the city very well. There are two big players that might truly 
um, create fixes. One are governments and the other is the market. And the market, by the market, I'm referring to corporate players, you know, the big buyers and sellers of fish and also the merchant marine, you know, big movers of cargo. Uh, we can probably get a lot more done via the market than we can governments because of the nature of governments. You know, they're political and they're, their jurisdiction's limited and they have they're out of office every four years and you know all sorts of reasons they don't play nice with each other and, and they don't even have jurisdiction on the high season whereas the the market players they have a lot of speedier and potentially more effective leverage over the players because those players want to sell to them so you've got some really large purchasers of seafood food service companies these are the um the the companies that sell to stadiums they sell to universities they sell to the ho hotels um, and so they purchase huge, huge volumes of seafood. Retailers, these are large downstream actors that are multinational corporations that purchase and sell very, very large amounts of seafood that can influence their upstream suppliers. Everybody has a role to, to play. And industry certainly has a role to play. Uh, we must operate responsibly and ethically, and we must be held accountable by our investors and our consumers. And where that isn't enough, government needs to come in and make sensible policy to fill in the gap. So that doesn't always happen, but that's what I think should happen. So, you know, people can vote with their dollars, and I, I think that's gonna be ultimately, that plus meaningful legislation uh, is gonna be what ultimately moves us in the right direction. But I'm excited about it because uh, there's, I think, an increasing willingness to pay a little bit more for products that are better quality and that are sourced more ethically and more sustainably. Businesses will follow suit as they see their preferences of their customers change. But you know, this is a lot of expense and who's going to bear this expense? It, 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 to some extent, um, it has to be at a governmental developmental level or at the sort of big global businesses because small scale fishers um, or smaller um, processing plants and so on would necessarily have that sort of disposable income um, and cash to to invest in this. But this is an opportunity for those who want to really see sustainable fisheries um, to support. I hate um, broad brushstroke painting anything. Not all wild caught is good, that's for sure. Not all farmed is bad. It's necessary because we don't. there's not enough fish in the ocean to feed the world. There just isn't. And the only way that we are going to supply protein to everybody um, is through aquaculture. The devil is always in the details, right? So first of all, what type of fish are we talking about? In terms of the carbon emissions, the pollution, concerns and the protein inputs. The minute you started penning chickens, pigs and cattle, you had all sorts of new problems. Um, and it's the same story in, in, in industrial scale aquaculture, how you feed them, how you get rid of their waste, the emissions, the antibiotics. Um, so all of these are big concerns. And the fish meal one is a major concern from a human point of view just because one of the main motivations of aquaculture was to slow down ocean depletion and now you have some of the worst ships on the under the sun from a labor and environmental perspective depleting the oceans at an even faster rate to grind the stuff up and feed them to the farm fish so people wanted to eat salmon and tuna and things like that so we tried to grow salmon and tuna and all those crops the trouble is that's a wild palate right no one asked the the ocean what does it make sense to grow what's unique about the ocean as an agricultural space. And when you ask that question, the answer, the answer comes back from our waters, why don't you grow things that don't swim away and you don't have to feed? And that's why there is this answer in the middle of like, yes, let's farm the ocean, but let's farm the right species. My view on this is we need to move not to looking at things that are sustainable, but things that are regenerative. Sustainability is a great goal, but it's not enough in the era of climate change. Like sustainability is about taking something that has a high level of impact and making it better, making a bad thing better, right? Regeneration is about taking things and growing them that can actually address and breathe life back into our ocean while you're feeding people. So that's why shellfish and seaweed, these things that don't swim away become core and I think need to be center of the, center of the plate. 
And as soon as you flip, flip that, the economics work because the overhead's so low for the farmer. The ecological aspect works because all the species are capturing carbon, nitrogen, rebuilding reef systems, and the scalability works because these are just cheap and fast to build. Um, so that's, from my perspective, that's the next phase of aquaculture, moving from growing things that swim away to growing regenerative species that um, are stable and just way easier to work with. Certain aquaculture gets a bad rap and it should. You know, in a place like the US or in a, other developed nations that have the capability of regulating and where there's really good um, community buy-in, you know, you can have a wild fishery that's well managed, it's sustainable and, and it, um, it supports the community. That's wonderful when it's possible. I think when you get into Central America and Colombia, it's more difficult because the resources for management are, are less, are less available. And in that sense, aquaculture can provide better outcomes in terms of like quality assurance, uh, in terms of production scale, uh, as well as, you know, when done correctly in terms of environmental impact. At Scripps, we're focusing on aquaculture of seaweeds for two solutions, growing seaweed for food and the other for feed. Current research in the Smith Lab involves the cultivation of several native seaweeds for human consumption, as well as other types that are being explored as a potential additive in cattle feed to reduce methane emissions from cow burps. By fine-tuning methods in a lab setting, science can help support the responsible growth of new sectors in the blue economy, create good jobs, supply locally grown superfoods, and even fight the causes of climate change. The sun, the sand, and the sea are, of course, not unique to the Caribbean. I think what's more unique is, um, is culture, is heritage, is the music, is the local attraction, is the food. And strangely enough, um, Caribbean food is not often in the local hotels and restaurants. I'm not sure if you've realized that. The, the, the sort of like high, higher end or chain restaurants are opting for European or American menus. And that's disappointing because the food's really the gateway to culture and, and, and the gateway to, to heritage of people. Should Caribbean governments um, legislate for local um, at a policy level so that local restaurants and hotels supply local and sustainably caught fish and seafood. Um, and an example of that that I had seen in 2019 was the Lombardy region in Italy, who legislated that, that farmhouses, um, farmhouse hotels supply 80% local wine and local food. Now, you know, this is an opportunity perhaps for the Caribbean now as we sort of relook at our path towards um, building back blue or building back better, whatever we want to call it, um, out of the corona and how we relook at our tourism products as well. So it's a question that is a good one to ask. There are going to be no jobs on a dead ocean, right? Ecological collapse is a kitchen table issue. The old battles of the old economy aren't appropriate anymore. Right? There are going to be new alliances, new rules, and I'm very open to all the different kind of partnerships. I do know there needs to be consensus on mission and values, and that's why discussions of sustainability and regeneration can like be so important, in, in, in a sense, to sort of set the benchmarks as we build something new. You have average buyers, right? Just consumers, you know, who buy food. Um, you have other types of stakeholders like chefs, Jose Andres, you know, like celebrity chefs, chefs who oversee buying for entire institutions like Marriott, you know, like chefs in key positions to make key decisions discreetly internally to big buyers, right? And then you have corporations like Nestle or Bumblebee, you know, um, that are buying fish. And so all of these different players, lawyers, huge role, suing companies, you know, kind of um, really pushing their tools into this space, getting the anti-trafficking community on the one hand, who focus largely on land, to start thinking about this sort, sort of sea slavery concerns, but also getting the ocean folks, the green folks, the Oceanas, to actually think about the human issues as well, not just the fish issues, getting all those folks to start moving in a unified direction, I think, is um, the other key thing.
if, if your seafood is caught, then it's shipped and it's offloaded and then it's processed and then it's re-exported, how do you follow that piece of fish throughout the supply chain? It requires every single person or every single entity in that supply chain to col collaborate and cooperate with it. There's a lot of pressure from investors to think about the next quarter. But for us, you know, we have to think about the next generation in terms of our, our employees, their families, our members and their families. We're not just in it to make money. This is about, you know, being a responsible member of the communities where we, where we have our businesses. So I think it's essential. Um, and every business, every part of industry is going to have to incorporate this into their business model in one way or another. The complex issues facing our seafood system requires this integration of quantitative data about the ocean, an understanding of the seafood supply chain, and insights into human behavior, culture, and taste. So Scripps and NOAA scientists, chefs, fishermen, processors, and students were working all together to capture the full value of the landed catch in San Diego. And our goal is to move the San Diego seafood system towards zero waste while enhancing our food security and supporting fishing families. We're tackling this by sharing cultural knowledge across diverse communities, partnering with chefs and teaching home cooks how to cook all of the parts of the fish and to diversify their seafood palate and working with entrepreneurs to transform the inedible parts of the fish into economic value. That was a terrific film. Thank you, Salty Cinema. And let's jump straight into questions. Please remember that you can still submit your questions in the chat feature right over here. Vito, let's start with you. I know that you've been a, a busy person recently, and, and recently uh, I couldn't keep the, the restaurant open with all the other responsibilities, but the restaurant you had in Montserrat uh, kept, you, kept you busy. You had to balance the needs of your business, your supplier, your consumer. How did you communicate your sustainable choices? And have you seen that your, how did you see your consumers, your customers connect with your choices? Yeah, so, um... First of all, just, you know, a big thanks for having me here. It's been a pleasure. I enjoyed the um, session so far. But um, the sustainable choices I communicated really through social media, um, a lot of that. So we had a Facebook page. We um, shared on Instagram and encouraged our staff, who we were all quite young and hip and happening, to share as well all the, um, the new catch, fresh catch coming in and so on. Um, and customers really enjoyed that. We were known to be a spot where you can get your fresh fish and you'll be able to get your fresh lionfish as well. So um, once those alerts went out to the public, we would see that um, people were in, in the house to enjoy um, all of that as well. And we spent a lot of time really communicating with our fishers and showing that their faces and telling their stories as and when we, we, um, you know, we, we sold our food as well. Great, thank you, uh, David. To take this up one one scale, I, I, how do you, how are consumer preferences uh, around sustainability influencing your purchasing and marketing efforts within the Price Mart uh, Seafood Program? Thank you, Stuart. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we're seeing, especially in in Central America, a hard push from our members. Uh, to ask about transparency, about where the food comes from, a desire to see local local food. Uh, we have some wonderful uh, local suppliers that we work with that have a lot of information and content that we can share with our members. Um, but uh, generally, you know, people want to know where their food comes from. And there's a sense that, uh, you know, having food that's good quality and at a fair price, but also that isn't bad for the environment or, you know, isn't damaging for the environment is really important to our members, and especially to the to the younger generation of members that are, you know, the ones that are um, my age, essentially, that are coming to shop with us. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're following in suit and doing our best to communicate in the different channels that are available to us, um, both in person in the, in the clubs, as well as on social media, uh, 
and um, yeah, so it's it's been really exciting, and hopefully, it's something that enables our members to be more in touch with us as a company, but also more importantly, in touch with the producers of these products. Thanks, David. Bren, I, I was hoping to to move over to the the idea of aquaculture writ large. Uh, we see that that aquaculture has grown to provide over half of the ocean's food production. Uh, if, in in a few thoughts, uh, how should a conscientious consumer view this statistic, with optimism or pessimism? We got you on mute right now, Brent. Sorry, you know, as I said in the video, it's really we we're at this really important moment of how do we harvest food from the ocean? Um, uh, as our food as our land based food systems get pushed out to sea, we're going to need to farm but we need to look at the ocean as unique agricultural space. And I think as a consumer, um, uh, uh, it's really time to begin rethinking aquaculture. You know, aquaculture has the worst brand names in the grocery store. And, um, uh, but there is this other path, you know, the first regenerative ocean farmers were indigenous communities in the Pacific Northwest building clam walls. Like we have been cultivating regenerative species that breathe life back into ecosystems for 5,000 years. So um, I think there's an incredible opportunity to sort of aggressively eat right now as a way to participate in sort of a solutions-based uh, approach to some of the problems we face. Yeah, thank you. I think we're gonna dig more into that in a bit. Sarah, I did wanna uh, touch on some ideas about the wild caught fisheries. Uh, your work includes some heavy issues surrounding bycatch, human trafficking, child labor, and the seafood supply chain. How has this impacted your view of the industry? So bycatch first. Um, and for those of you who don't know what bycatch is, it's the unintentional capture of species in fishing gear. So you might be fishing for one species and you accidentally catch a whale or a sea turtle. Um, and so for the, when I started studying bycatch, the thing that really struck home for me was how much fishing gear is in the water and how big the gear is. So it's miles long sometimes, it's, it's, it's multiple miles long. So for example, if you commute 30 miles to your job, there and picture a long line that goes from your front door to your office, and that's a short long line. So um, it can be hundreds of miles long. So to me, just trying to wrap my head around how much and how big the gear is was something that I, you know, I, I really struggled with and, and that was sort of what struck home for me for, with the bycatch issue. Um, with the forced labor and human trafficking and child labor issues, it's really, to me, it, it hit home how murky seafood supply chains can be. Um, and I'm not talking about the local ones, I'm talking about these international seafood supply chains where there's fishing offshore and you can catch a product legally and you can catch a product illegally and you can have people who have been um, in forced labor and debt bondage and, and that product is being mixed or processed with product that's legitimate, that's been caught legally. And how do, you, how do you tease that apart? And so I think for me, just when I was starting to work on the forced labor issues, it was really hit home um, how difficult it is to trace seafood products from uh, the shore back to where it was caught. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And Ian, you may know that better than anybody on this planet. Thanks for uh, not being on a ship right now and joining us for this. Uh, your reporting for the Outlaw Ocean Project uh, explores that line between civilization and the lack of it in, um, in the seas. Uh, do you think that the public is generally, is generally aware of the lawlessness of the ocean? And uh, is it important that the public should know about this? Uh, yeah. No. Thanks for having me. Um, no, I mean, I think um, I, I don't think the public generally um, has an awareness of the of several things. One is um, the diversity of um, concerns that exist out there offshore. Uh, I think the typical public uh, may uh, have inklings of the concerns that are climate change, acidification, overfishing, plastic pollution, the BP spill, Somali piracy, you know, a lot of these things have bubbled up into the public conscience through 
you know, Hollywood and the like. Um, and, um, but the spectrum is very narrow. Um, and there's also no overarching um, framework by which to organize that spectrum. So, you know, one of the things, I, goals we had reporting was to broaden that spectrum out, you know, include murder of stowaways and intentional dumping of oil and sea slavery and illegal whaling and, you know, repo man at sea and, you know, the, the wide variety of other human rights, labor and environmental concerns and quite um, especially the intersectionality of these abuses um, was really important to impress upon the public in a sustained way. And then secondly, to try to, in the very fabric of that process, offer an organizational principle that brought it all together. And that, you know, is metaphor jumping, but, you know, one, it, it's all under the umbrella of a sheer lack of governance. Um, it's also under the umbrella of what was said earlier, um, uh, a fundamental problem with um, uh, kind of a, a look to a lean towards, I think Brand said it really well, you know, sustainable, not regenerative, um, you know, kind of the, the core assumptions of what's allowable and what even we should strive for, even within aquaculture, for example, um, have real big problems in them and sort of a shift in that matrix of thinking. Um, so um, I think uh, the public generally, um, uh, is more informed now than they were five years ago about the about the urgency and the diversity, and also sort of um, you know organizing principles. You know the notion of hidden costs, the notion of subsidies. Sea slavery is a subsidy. You know um, uh, you know th these sorts of things are now more commonplace for people to think the connection between ocean plastic and sea slavery and overfishing. This is starting to become more um, core to how companies and consumers and taxpayers are talking and thinking. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you. And uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, Brent, we have a question from Travis Beckman. He's asking, uh, what, are the, what are the current uh, technological limitations in the fields of sustainability and regenerative ocean farming and aquaculture? And what skill sets uh, are needed? You know, um, growing food underwater is kind of dumb. Right? It's the most volatile place to grow food in the world. I can't control my soil, I can't augment it, and I can't see what I grow. Right? So that, what's that's meant, I'm a technophobe, but what it's meant is that um, data and sort of augmented farming becomes central to be eyes and ears under there. I mean, if I plant my kelp in a two degree temperature difference, my yields um, differ significantly. Right, so I need that precision farming. So we're working, for example, with so far a, um, uh, um, a um, sensor company to get uh, buoys on our farm so that uh, we're able to become better farmers. So that data piece is, um, I think is, is key. Um, the other, uh, uh, what was the other piece, skills, you said? Sorry, I missed it. Skills indeed. Yeah, so what's, so what's interesting I think is we've got a, a jobs pipeline at Green Wave. Our, our goal is to train 10,000 new hatchery uh, technicians and farmers in the next 10 years. And the hatchery level, Farm level, it's really a community college track, and we've been able to bring a strong sort of social justice jobs pipeline um, uh, uh, along that. But it's all hands on deck. I mean, I meet, need folks um, uh, uh, drafting new policy permits. I need business planners. I need entrepreneurs. I need people inventing new bio. You know what I mean? On and on and on, because it's kind of a blank slate out there, and all the pieces need to meet, move at once. So mm -hmm. help. Yeah, that's great to hear. I think I, I think that Travis has a job ahead. Uh, Sarah, um, Misty Johnson Gibbon uh, has a question for you saying, those of us at the consumer level uh, that try to do the right thing uh, for those of us, uh, how reliable are the claims from retail grocery store outlets like Whole Foods regarding their sustainability claims since seafood is often harder to trace than beef, pork, et cetera? Well, I think it depends on the retailer. Um, Whole Foods actually has its own chain of custody. Uh, and chain of custody is where you can trace the product back to where it was caught or where it was farmed. Um, mo probably a lot of other um, retailers may or may not have that. Um, I know that they do make that pledge. Um, I work for a seafood ratings program. We don't have chain of custody. So ratings program, we have a stoplight system, red, yellow, and green. Um, and so that means that we assess 
it's, we call it involuntary. So we assess what's important to our business partners and um, what's important uh, to the US market. And so we assess products that don't come out well, like the red, as well as ones that do come out better, like the green, the blue, the yellow and the, and the green. Um, but we don't have that assurance, that chain of custody. That's not something we provide. There are um, seafood uh, and, and there are seafood certification programs like the Marine Stewardship Council or the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, and they do have that chain of custody. They are voluntary. So if a fishery or a, a part, portion of a fleet thinks that it's operating better than its, its cohort or its other, other in others in the fleet, um, they can seek that eco certification and they pay a fee for that. And part of that fee or a lot of part of that fee goes to that chain of custody so that that claim, they can put a label on a package. So Seafood Watch does not put a label on a package, but the Marine Stewardship Council and the other, um, the, the certification programs do have that chain of custody. So, a lot um, so of, that level of assurance. So we can't guarantee if you're at the seafood counter and you're like, oh, this is green, I wanna, I'm gonna buy this. We can't, we don't make any guarantees that what is at that seafood counter is what we assessed. Great. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Vita, we have a question for you um, uh, about your uh, the community work that you've done uh, that complements the restaurant work. Uh, a lot of that work was on in Montserrat saying, uh, work with communities and the island nations of the Caribbean. How does that inform uh, consumers in larger nations, especially around stakeholder engagement and creating positive, productive relationships? Are there lessons learned? Yeah, um, how does, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I've, I fully understood the question. So the lessons learned from, from stakeholder engagement on the ground with um, international companies. No, from, from, uh, from the uh, island level uh, insights, how, does that, uh, how can that apply to larger nations, especially in terms of stakeholder engagement and creating positive productive relationships? Um, it's just i think i think it's just um from my experience having conversations with people being real um having sometimes uncomfortable relationships um and conversations it's really quite critical um and i think also working with the fishes the fishing communities on islands uh is also tends to be quite sensitive work that makes that takes a little bit more time building trust is really important and so i think um with with um you know international organizations wanting to do more work around sustainable fisheries for instance there does need to be um more time plotted in for really this uh, this this engagement the communication and relationship building aspect which i think is often forgotten um we focus a lot on the movement of the fish and 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 the business behind of it all and not sufficiently on the people and so um, I think the aspects that I am able to contribute throughout my work is a, a, a real sort of insight in the relationship building behind, um, you know, building very sustainable relationships amongst fishers and communities uh, that depend on the sea. I hope that answered your question, I'm not sure. I, I think it did. It answered a question for me, so I learned a lot. So thank you. <laughs> Ian, um, we have a, a question from uh, Emily Parker saying that one of the major issues with creating customer-friendly sustainable seafood resources is traceability. How do you feel that this should best be tackled through policy uh, or through policy and legislation? Um, no, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, yes. Um, I think David um, summed it up well, but I just don't have a huge amount of faith, as I said in the video, um, that governments would be agile enough that they they play well together. Um, all the problems with governments, especially when you try to get them to work together on something like, you know, a global common such as the high seas, um, and dealing with a, a, a commodity and a workforce that's traversing this space. Um, it, it just, uh, I'm very skeptical that the kinds of fixes we need will be 
coming from governments. I mean, there, there's important stuff happening. Look at the biodiversity treaty going on at the UN. So, so governments have a role to play, international bodies have a role to play. But, but I really do think um, it, it's um, the, the market and, and the market players, um, uh, so buyers and sellers and consumers and chefs and these sorts of stakeholders are, are where I'm watching closest um, uh, and more optimistic about. Um, and then I also just think like, there are other types of stakeholders that fit in neither category, like NGOs, you know, that are, you know, doing really interesting things, academics, you know, Global Fishing Watch and Fishwise and, you know, um, uh, you know, lots of organizations out there that are playing a key role and journalists, you know, truth be told, I do think unless you keep, and this isn't me as a journalist, but journalists in general, you know, um, keeping the public focus on these issues. So those stakeholders too, I think are gonna be really important, but I'm mostly, and, and truth be told on the issue of sea slavery, um, uh, when I talk with folks in the field, um, the, the very players that should be moving the most, i.e. the market players on, on sea slavery, um, quite especially labor concerns are moving the least and slowest. Um, I'm hearing that there's just real frustration from advocates and lawyers and such um, uh, in terms of getting big corporate players to um, reckon with their supply chains. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. David, I've got a, a, a quick question for you then. We're going to go to the, the question for each of you. Uh, and and uh, we're, we're, I'm, I'm getting in my ear that we're running out of time. This question is from Andy Paul uh, saying, should we raise prices to reduce demand to release the, to relieve stress on fragile ecosystems? Using that example of uh, limited old growth temperate or li limiting forestry on uh, old growth forests is a, is an economic price going to help us with uh, rarity and fragile ecosystems. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so I, I do think that there's an element to this of non-market valuation that we're not accounting for the ecological impacts of, of this industry. However, if it's applied to one retailer and not another, uh, you know, you know, the free market, uh, people are just going to take their demand elsewhere and then that it's not going to be a systemic change. So I, I do think there, if there's a way to do that through functional policy, I, I, It'd be great. I, I just I don't know if that's going to happen. I I think about price smart at least not right now. I think about where we op, where we have our businesses in Central America, and we're a regional player. Each country has its own laws and policies, some of which are uh, enforced and regulated better than others. Uh, and you know, and even to make this matter more complicated, if you go up the value chain, the fish are caught all over the place, right? And to Sarah's point. It's hard to know where these things were caught and you know where where things hit along that supply chain. So, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we need to account for the cost of these things on the planet, and it would be great if we could do that. Um, but there's not a good world governing body to institute that uh, a tax essentially, um, where we would account for the ecological impact. There just isn't. Uh, to one thing I just want to point that uh, Sarah mentioned about traceability, I, there, there are some tools, uh, certain country or the EU, for example, mandates certain types of reporting for retailers there. Um, and so as you assess the retailer that you're going to go to or the store you're going to go to, there, are, there are, are a lot of resources and look into some of those reporting tools that retailers use. Uh, and they can tell you a lot about what's going on with that, the given retailer. And even there, you're still going to run into issues, but they're, you know, we're, we're trying our best uh, and it's an easy problem to solve. So David, I think you, you uh, answered the closing question already for us. Uh, Sarah, I'm gonna ask you to go next, which is how can each of us improve our relationship with the sea through our seafood choices? Our quick parting thoughts. Quick parting thoughts. All right, well, of course, I'm gonna say use for environmental reasons. Um, Use the you know the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. Uh, our, check out our website. Um, educate yourself. Um, talk to your local fishermen. Um, you know if you can, if you live near a coast, that would be great because then you're also getting that labor tackling the labor issue. Um, just tomorrow we are releasing another version of our seafood slavery risk tool, which is a business facing tool to assess the risks of forced labor, human trafficking, and hazardous child labor. So we're hoping that businesses will start using that tool. 
to start tackling their supply chains as well. So, um, so stay tuned, that's coming up. Uh, but that, I guess those are my quick sound bites. And then of course, there's also um, the eco certification. So we've got rating certifications and uh, other tools to, to help you make those decisions. Um, David, and David, and sir, you know, you say more, more information. Uh, Bren, how do we re in, improve, improve our relationship with the sea through our seafood choices? Yeah, um, I struggle with the, the speed of consumer choice, quite honestly. Like, um, will that fast happen fast enough on the clock we're on for climate change, right? And I really don't know the answer. It's one of the pieces that have to happen. I do know that we need sort of millions of people joining this climate solutions space of building mm -hmm. sort of a politics of yes. So let's not be conservationist environmentalists saying no to a seal fishery, right? We can do that, but let, let's actually figure out what we're gonna say yes to that, uh, that um, uh, sort of rebuilds the planet, creates jobs and um, creates resilient communities. So look for that yes, um, uh, as you're going you know, through your careers and through what you eat. Bravo. Vita, do you wanna provide us your thoughts? How do we do it? How do we improve our relationship with the sea through our seafood choices? We've got you on mute. I think through, you know, education is really a key part um, and collaborating for education. I think a lot of the work that needs to be done around sustainability for fisheries requires a lot of modernization of fisheries. And at least from my side of the world, um, there's still a lot of work to be done there that really needs to engage young people. And uh, there are many ways that we can um, we can do that, uh, such as you know establishments such as the you know Scripps and, and, and other companies that are here, is um, is to 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 focus a little bit more on that. Um, perhaps having young people on boards, having them on fishing com committees and um, and associations, and um, yeah, posting your choices. Just some practical things. Post your choices, your fish choices when you when you see them. Um, educate yourselves and other people and elevate people around you. So when you see, you know, um, companies, businesses, fishers, um, brands who are really doing the positive work, then, you know, um, put your might and support behind them, champion um, and promote them. Um, and even for a little bit of advice for working um, in small islands like where I'm from is, um, you know, if you, you visit the Caribbean and you see um, a particular restaurant or hotel or, or something that you're really proud of or you, you like a fisher that you like, then reach out to them. Find out, you know, what are, what are some of the resources, skills and support that you can offer. Um, throughout your own network. And this is, these, these issues are massive issues. We can't do it alone. So I think collaborating in education uh, is, is really quite key. Thank you, yeah. And Ian, I'm gonna give you the closing thoughts on this question. How can we improve our relationship with our seafood choices? Uh, it's terrible to go last because all the good answers have been taken. <laughs> I mean, I, I think um, Vita hit on a couple of points I think are really smart. I mean, not just, buying local but supporting local you know kind of ngos and restaurants and you know um really thinking about um smaller organizations uh that are engaging on a very local level even if it's not your local um mm -hmm. is key um uh i i do think also in any discussion like this it shouldn't be a multiple choice that doesn't also have the option of not eating seafood. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think that is an important um, option that should be in the discussion and, and, and I, I'm not advocating for it, but I just think it's, it's a framing that, that is problematic to not be also saying, maybe we need to get off of um, eating um, seafood or, or uh, animals in general. Um, uh, that should be part of the discussion. But, but I think as Bren said as well, um, you know, um, in really trying to focus not on the no's, but the yeses, and where there are really promising, you know, options that we can get behind um, in terms of consumer choices, be they seafood or anything, are, are key. So I'm just going to echo the, the those two. Yeah, wise words across the board. Thank you, and thank you everybody in the audience for the questions. This conversation is going to continue. Our goal tonight was to open the doors behind the seafood scene and provide opportunities for you to engage with us at Scripps Oceanography and with our friends as we, con as we consider pressing questions in the face of the realities of today's challenges. We'd like to thank our panelists.
for participating in today's event. Our partners at the fishery and our sponsor Cutwater Spirits for helping us bring you tonight's experience. Our VIP guests, a percentage of the, the cost that went to benefit our exciting new marine conservation and technology facility at Scripps Oceanography. And to our audience for your sustained interest in learning about the ocean and the role that you play in its future. Part of our relationship with the ocean here at Scripps is changing as we speak. I'd like to share with you now a, a, a little bit about our new marine conservation technology facility currently under construction on the north end of Scripps campus. We're looking forward to completion of the project so we can host future events like this one, uh, along with scientific uh, discussions and collaborations, and of course, the conservation research of this new facility. MCTF is gonna be the physical home of our Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation, helping us take a greatly increased role in the global arena of science for solutions in marine biodiversity and conservation. Before we end this evening, we'd like to share with you a video fly through of the new Marine Conservation and Technology Facility. And we hope to welcome you to our new building in person and in hybrid experiences uh, in the near future. If marine conservation, this new physical building or things you're passionate about, don't hesitate to reach out. We'd love to talk to you more about ways that you can get involved. So let's take a tour of our new building now and take a tour of our tomorrow. For over 100 years, Scripps Institution of Oceanography has been a leader in understanding and protecting the planet. Now, we're embarking on a new journey to continue our mission. Envision a place where data scientists, engineers, and conservation groups are working with marine biologists, traditional leadership, and policymakers to develop strategies around the management of our ocean ecosystems. Envision a place where industry leaders, chefs, and scientists are collaborating on solutions for overfishing and seafood sustainability. Now, envision this place on the Scripps Oceanography Campus, surrounded by some of the world's top climate scientists, global policy experts, oceanographers, and engineers. The new Marine Conservation and Technology Facility is poised to take a greatly increased role in the global arena of science for solutions in marine biodiversity and conservation. The Marine Conservation and Technology Facility will have modern classroom facilities, which will enable the development of novel training programs, including a 100-seat lecture hall, 11 research laboratories, and two class laboratories. The facility will have a state-of-the-art data visualization laboratory to integrate novel data sources. The basement will be almost entirely devoted to a saltwater research aquarium where researchers can study marine organisms and test new technologies. The building will feature a coastal view cafe, a space that will stimulate ideas and bring together the local community, scientists, students, and visiting global experts, as well as a demonstration kitchen where local chefs can educate students on and prepare sustainable seafood to be served in the facility's cafe space. This new facility will be a critical advancement for Scripps. New challenges to the health of the planet require urgent solutions across many disciplines at an unprecedented scale. We invite you to join us in a new era of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, an era defined by solutions-based science that will shape our understanding and how we approach protecting our planet. Thank you. 